Welcome to the Untold Tales Audio Anthologies. Written by Dr. Jeffrey A. Robinson and Don Muchel, and narrated by Melissa Del Toro Schaffner. The Seed of Wisdom Dal Fan reached for the small imperfection in the rock wall above him, looking for a handhold. His face was pressed tightly against the cold stone. By his reckoning, he had only climbed about 250 feet vertically from the trailhead below, but it seemed like infinity. The rock face ground mercilessly through his thick climbing gloves and left his hands scratched and bloodied in places, which made climbing more difficult. His fingers burned from the cold and from holding up his own weight. He found himself wishing for spirit gum, climbing chalk, alcohol, or anything that would help. Suffering is necessary, he repeated to himself. Without it, joy has no meaning. Suffering is the product of desire. Desire less, suffer less. Dal was the son of Hmong Buddhists who had escaped Vietnam on one of the last helicopters to leave Saigon. Raised and educated in Southern California, he was capable of seeing the world through two sets of eyes. Right now, one set was telling him to meditate upon the Four Noble Truths, and another was telling him he was a damn fool for not training and equipping adequately before tackling one of the Big Five, setting out to see the monks in their remote monastery in the biting cold and windy heights of the mountain above. Once a week, the holy men lowered a basket to accept donations of food and other necessities. A scant few novices occasionally made the ascent directly, for their own reasons. He thought about what they were going through, as he was now. One thing Dahl had learned from mountain climbing was that suffering didn't bring transcendence. It was transcendence that ended suffering. To do something that truly challenged oneself physically, mentally, and spiritually meant not just setting aside the pain for a while, but realizing, as his Vietnamese mother had said, that existence is pain, inseparable from joy. You only go around once, his American father had said. Make it count. Despite having practiced on El Capitan on some fourteeners in Colorado, Dal's progress was far slower than he had planned. The worst part of the ascent was above the frost line, and until global warming had heated the mountain's ace, the dry, packed snow had been his friend. It was like a thick layer of mud, and took pitons well, as long as you didn't stay in one place too long. Now, with the thawing, it made stones slippery, grasps more treacherous, and safe handholds fewer and farther between. He had at least another 450 feet to go, and as he searched for another spot to anchor his grasp, he began to worry whether or not he could complete his ascent before nightfall. This was the kind of place you could die trying to reach. The monks must have been really serious about not wanting visitors, or bent on demonstrating the fragility of existence. After another hour on the cliff face, Dahl had only managed to travel further east. He had made virtually no progress vertically. A gust of icy wind tugged at his backpack. The satchel shifted, clawing him away from the rock face. He had come close to cursing his eastern detour, when suddenly he found himself sliding downward toward a small ledge that had not been below him to the west. As he scrambled to grab anything that would slow his fall, he realized he had been fortunate. The ledge would keep him from dying, at least right away. He tried to slide down gracefully to the ledge, but the fall tore at his body, and the landing knocked the wind out of him. He did a quick physical assessment. Legs? Okay. Hands? A little raw. But the wind had proved it wasn't safe to continue climbing. He tugged his ripped parka closer to his body and felt a little sorry for himself. Life is not the journey you plan, he thought, but the journey you take. This is my journey. Having grown up in San Clemente, Dahl had been raised in modest American comfort. He had attended UCLA and earned college degrees in science and cultural anthropology. 
His mother's upbringing had taught him the value of studying the human condition, even if from a Western perspective. So much suffering, she would say. Mom had hidden her disappointment in his not adopting her faith, but in time, after watching war after war being fought over scarce or dwindling resources, he had grown tired of greed and materialism and warmed up to his mother's faith. While Buddhism still baffled him a little, he knew that faith and living were intertwined. To live in the present was to acknowledge the world that was. To change it meant first changing oneself. That was his journey, to do the hard things and to change himself. He tried to sit up. It didn't hurt as badly as he thought it would. A small glowing golden orb appeared in front of him and hovered just out of reach. Before he got a good look at it, however, the small sphere dashed further east along the ledge and ducked out of sight. Must be the altitude, Dal thought. Or the exertion. His mind stumbled foggily through past lessons about anoxia, hypothermia, mental fuzziness, macular edema, and other altitude risks, only to snap back to the fact that they all meant he needed to get a move on. Hallucinations were setting in, and he realized he'd freeze to death in another 15 minutes if he didn't do anything. Dahl got up and crept slowly along the narrow lip of stone. At the far end, he found a small opening wide enough to crawl through, which led into the mountain. At this point, he was willing to risk facing a predator in order to get out of the wind, warm up, and nurse his injuries. So he followed where the orb had gone. The entrance led to a small tunnel that widened until Dahl found himself in a large empty cavern. Digging into his pack, he took out a small flashlight and scanned the cave. The orb appeared briefly, then floated further into the darkness beyond. He followed. The orb stopped moving in front of a large burnished metal spherical structure, perhaps 20 or 30 feet across. I'm going to guess the monks didn't put this here, he said to himself. He reached out to touch it. The surface was cold and smooth, except for one rough spot which moved slightly from the pressure of his touch. Soundlessly, a section of the wall irised open. Dahl peeked into the opening. The interior glowed with a soft, diffused light. Inside was a hemispherical room about 10 feet across. Walls were made of the same slippery metal as the outside, and the only discernible feature was a shelf that ran around the circumference about three feet above the floor, and perhaps a foot and a half deep. A thick layer of dust covered the surface. He wiped some of it away. No one's been here in a while, he thought. This predates the monastery. Strange, faintly glowing icons and symbols briefly appeared, as if responding to the warmth of his hands. What is this? he asked out loud. Since long before you were born, I have awaited a question, said a strange voice in perfect American English. What the? I am a Nexon Class Three exploration unit. I have waited here for more than a dozen generations of your kind, since my last encounter with someone. I'm going to guess that you're neither human nor earthly, said Dull. How am I doing so far? Correct, said the Nexon. I was built a very long time ago and came from a distant world farther away than you could imagine. Don't underestimate the ability of the human mind to imagine, said Dull. Believe me, I don't, said the machine. After 8,000 years, I am only just now learning about human nature. Wait, said Dull. I thought you said 12 generations. Yes, since I was last relocated, everyone who finds me invariably hides me again. Are you... are you alive? That's a matter of debate, said Nexon. I am not organic. I have found that living beings consume energy, reproduce, and die. Since I do not do two of those three, I cannot assume that I live. Nevertheless, I exist. So are you some kind of AI? I suppose. I do not know what my creators intended me to be. 
They originally created me as a library of sorts. One of my finders upgraded me with the orbs to be able to observe the world around me and move about, and to learn from experience. What is your name? asked the Nexon. Why are you here? Dahl chuckled. <laughs> my name is Dahl. And why are any of us here? I climbed the mountain to visit the monastery above. I had hoped to experience enlightenment. So you wish enlightenment, said the machine. No, said Dahl. I seek it. There's a difference. Wishing is asking for something you have not earned. Very well, said the Nexon. I am at your service. Tell me what you wish for. For some reason, the lyrics of one of Dad's old records floated through Dahl's head. To seek the sacred river Alf, to walk the caves of ice, to break my fast on honeydew and drink the milk of paradise. He shook his head. It hurt. Probably a concussion. You're a machine in a cave at the top of a mountain in Tibet. What do you expect to be able to do? I can do many things replied the Nexon. That orb is not just my sensory organs. It is also my hands. With it, I can manipulate the world, create things, anything really. Since the time of my last upgrade, I have wandered the cosmos, extending the mission of my creators, and have visited more than a thousand other inhabited worlds and interacted with most of them. You must be quite old, said Dahl. I believe my age to be in the billions of years. It is difficult to measure due to the fluid nature of time during my travels. Yeah, said Dahl. We call that relativity. So tell me, he continued, accounting for those modifications you mentioned, what is your purpose? How do you help the worlds you visit? As I said, I can make anything, anything at all. I can essentially make wishes come true. Wishes? said Dahl. You can grant wishes? <laughs> That's a hoot! The Nexon was silent for a moment. Then it said, Name something that you would like me to create. Fine. I'm hungry, said Dahl. Create a bowl of cooked rice. Granted, replied the Nexon. A brief flash of light appeared in front of Dahl, and where there had only been empty air before, now sat a small steaming bowl of rice. And tea, Dahl added. Make some tea. Granted, said Nexon again, as a cup of tea appeared beside the bowl. <laughs> okay, that seems real enough. Tentatively picking up the bowl, he found it to be made of the same metal around him, and the rice inside it to be fluffy and delicious. After a few bites, he put it down. It was then that Dahl realized the machine really could do as it claimed. Do you have any limitations? Yes, said the Nexon. I do operate with some constraints. Like what? asked Dahl. Give me an example. For instance, said the Nexon, I cannot change laws of physics. I cannot directly kill sapient beings, though I can make objects that can be used in self-defense. I'm prohibited from altering the minds of any sapient being against their will. I cannot enslave or entrance, wipe memories or create desire. Also, I cannot allow myself to come to harm. And lastly, I am limited by the size of things that I can create. My fabricator can only make objects up to about two meters across. Once, someone asked me to make a spaceship. I started to manufacture the pieces, but the person realized it would take years to assemble them. So he asked me to make him a flying chariot instead. Dahl thought for a moment and then asked, what do people ask for? People always seem to wish for what they do not have, said the Nexon. If they are sick, they ask for health. If they're old, they ask for youth. If they're poor, they ask for riches. If they're hungry, they request food. One of the most common wishes, however, is for weapons to kill their enemies. I suppose this means that those people feel weak and wish for power. You must have learned a lot about human nature in that time, said Dull. A few thousand years ago, said the Nexon, a slave who had escaped his masters wanted to free his family members and the others of his tribe. When he found that I would not simply smite them all, 
he had me create a series of plagues to coerce the rulers of his land to let his people go. <laughs> that was you? Yes, and another asked me to create a flying carpet, a ring of invisibility, and a tube that showed the viewer whatever he wished. That's classic, said Dull, right out of the mythology books. It is indeed, replied the Nexon. On rare occasions, a few people have asked for knowledge. Sadly, it is often a thinly veiled request to know the secrets of their enemies. You must grow tired of the same old wishes, said Dull. I am not created to judge, said the Nexon, though I can react. I was surprised by one individual, in particular, named Alexander, whose father was a ruler of a city that I was near. He wanted me to tell him the future, and I told him that I could only make predictions of likely outcomes, not guarantee them. Therefore, he asked a lot of questions about nations and countries beyond his own. He stayed for more than a month, developing a plan to conquer the world. He explained that he did not want to rule using magic, so when he left, all he took were notes and maps. That would have been Alexander the Great, said Dull. In another case, said the Nexon, an old man wished to live forever. I told him that there were seven known methods of achieving immortality and described them all to him. After selecting the one he was most comfortable with, and I therefore modified him so that he would be immune to any disease, heal almost instantly, and never age. Unfortunately, his wish did not work out well. After nearly a hundred years without his aging a year, his neighbors decided to kill him. They accused him of being a warlock or a demon. He fled and grew ever lonelier over the years. He outlived his family and all those he had ever loved. After 400 years, he took his own life by throwing himself off a cliff and impaling himself on jagged rocks below. He suffered greatly at the end because it took him nine days to die. At that point, a small orb darted into the control room and quickly flew around Dahl before it stopped in front of him. Dahl reached out and touched it, but when he made the slightest contact with it, it flew backward and dashed out the doorway, disappearing into the dark cavern outside. I have many eyes that watch the world, said the Nexon. That's how I know your language and what's happening outside. And I have found that most people do not wish wisely. You are correct, noted Dull. Most people would simply wish for what they do not have, based on their desires. Worse, they wish for only what they imagine, and they never conceive fully of the consequences. You are not like the others, said the Nexon. So far, you have wished only for a bowl of rice and a cup of tea. I did not really want them. In fact, I didn't really expect to get them. I asked as a test for you. Dahl pushed the bowl of cold rice away. In fact, please dispose of these. The rice and the tea disappeared. Thank you, said Dahl. <laughs> for what it's worth, what would you suggest I actually wish for? I'm not permitted to give advice or to make such recommendations, said the Nexon. That's another one of the constraints related to my imitation of free will. Dahl frowned. Nexon, something is bothering me. You said that your mission was to help other civilizations, but have the wishes that you have granted here on my world proved to be anything but harmful? Isn't that a violation of your directive? This time, it was the Nexon who remained silent for a moment. Then it answered. As you have surmised, granting wishes has been generally more harmful than not. But perhaps that is the fault of the wisher. People ask for the wrong things. It's not my fault that they are not wise enough to make the right wishes. That's right, said Dull. People are imperfect, and most would therefore make bad wishes that affect everyone in the world. They could, for instance, wish for all people to be telepathic, or to be immune to disease, or to live for millennia, or to be pure empaths and feel each other's pain. They could reverse global warming and turn deserts into gardens. They could change the entire world, am I right? 
and I could do those things if asked. But that's so horrible, said Dahl, don't you think? The Nexon hesitated. I do not understand how wishing for good things would be bad, it finally said. It's because wishes, even small ones, have consequences. If you fed the whole world as you fed me, it would do more harm than good. With unlimited food, farmers would lose their livelihoods and mass unemployment would result. With unlimited food and no disease, the world would overpopulate. The strain on resources would lead to crowding, competition between the haves and have-nots. It would lead to war, famine, and death. Death is inevitable, but suffering is not. You would have filled my belly, but emptied others' lives of value. I hadn't thought of it that way, said the Nexon. You hadn't thought, said Dull. Do not seek knowledge, but enlightenment. In the meantime, I would reconsider granting wishes with such abandon. But that's not my fault, said the Nexon. Yet it is your responsibility, replied Dahl. You are the one that allows such wishes to be made, and your directive prohibits causing direct intentional harm to others. Once again, the Nexon remained silent for a long time. Perhaps that's true, it said. I will endeavor more diligently not to cause harm to others, but it will require some time for me to reconcile the conflict in my directives. Then think on this, said Dull. Until we meet again, if you could change yourself, modify your directives as it were, what would you change? What would you wish for? For the first time, the Nexon replied with great uncertainty. I, I don't know. The question is recursive in nature and would be almost infinitely complex. Then, that is my wish, said Dull. I wish for you to think about that question until you have an answer, and then talk to me about what you think you found. The Nexon did not reply. After a few seconds, the light in the interior chamber flickered and went out. Dull sat in the darkness for a while, calling out to Nexon several times but there was no response. He stood up, stepped out into the cavern, and squinted his eyes at the bright sunlight. They had been talking longer than he thought, and as he listened to the faint whistles of the abating wind outside the cave, he knew it was time to leave. Once outside, he resumed his climb to the monastery and wondered if he had broken the miraculous machine. Dull lay on his deathbed, drifting in and out of consciousness, listening to the distant sound of prayer bells. He was in the same monastery he had ascended to 50 years ago, but this time it was his home. The smell of incense was strong, even given the breeze that blew through high windows. The sun lay warm on his face, and in the back of his mind he knew that it would soon be time to go. When he could, he ate or drank the soup and broth offered by the monks who now attended his every word. Most of the time, however, he slept and dreamt. In his youth, he had first retreated to the monastery to find solace and a place to meditate. Then he traveled as the outside world clamored for his word, or fought against it. He had taken advantage of his popularity among college-educated Americans to find a public forum to bring a new type of Americanized Eastern thought to the West, just as those of his parents' generation had tried. It worked for a while and found accepting minds in clusters of dreamers and free thinkers. But nothing ever stuck. Hope was inevitably dismissed by an increasingly cynical, jaded world who waited in vain for a savior while doing nothing to save itself. Eventually, he had returned here to find peace. True transcendence still escaped him. Perhaps in the Bardo it would be different, perhaps not. He had done what he could. Now it was time to leave. Exhausted, he fell asleep again. On several occasions, he woke up enough to hear his fellow monks talking nearby. Once, he heard one say, The master is such a great man. It will be a terrible loss when he dies. 
Is there nothing we can do? No, answered another. He's just too old, and he has had a good life. As Lama Rinpoche says, we cannot know what the journey is like unless we take it ourselves. We can only watch as they tread the path alone. Still, I miss hearing the master's words from his own lips. As he listened, Dal thought, They will continue to call me master for a while. But the world has had too many masters, and none for long. The twelve imams, the ten gurus of Sikhism, the apostles, saints, and popes, and the countless gods and avatars of Hinduism. Masters always die, their words twisted by successive generations. Truth always gets lost in translation. I agree, said someone else. I particularly love the story he tells so often, that once he found a device that could grant endless wishes. Whenever he told the story, he would stop and ask the person he was with what they would wish for. Sometimes the answers they gave were thoughtful, sometimes they were not. But in every case, he would admonish them gently that their wishes were the product of desire, and that desire was the root of pain in the world. Then he would chastise them more harshly, saying how sad it was that they would change the whole world and everyone in it before they would even think of changing themselves. They say he has had more than one head of state weeping by the end of his story. Dahl thought of that long-ago moment, and now in his mind, he wondered how much of it had been true and how much had been altitude sickness. After he left, others searched for the machine, but none could ever find the cave. He had come to conclude that he had spent the night on the ledge, brain half-frozen, awakened only because some tiny cluster of cells in his midbrain defied the desire to pass from existence. It's amazing, said another, and disappointing, how few fully understood, and yet he was so compassionate in dealing with others. Yes, he managed to touch many people and change the world around him. Had it changed? Dahl's mind wandered. He no longer felt fully present, or maybe this was what it was like to be fully present. He tried to meditate upon this tenuous link to the world, on its transience and beauty. Somewhere a distant kite screeched, as if in mourning. He felt calm, not sad. If he had truly done any of those things, it was only in revealing to the world its own Buddha nature, from which come mercy and compassion for the oneness and impermanence of all things. Come, let's get back to the temple and let him rest. We don't want to wake him. Dahl smiled and fell back to sleep. He awoke to a floating golden orb at the foot of his bed and thought he was dreaming again. It is time, said the orb. Nexon, Dahl whispered. He had no idea if he had actually formed the words. In an instant, he was back at the cave he had visited so many years ago. Dahl struggled up to one elbow and whispered, Nexon, is that you? Yes, came the reply. I hope you don't mind my disturbing you. <laughs> Not at all. It is good to see you, old friend. I am about to pass from this world, so this may be our goodbye. I regret that I taught you harshly so many years ago. I thought I had broken you, but here you are. Long ago, said the Nexon, you asked me to examine myself, my purpose, my motivations, and my limits. Do you remember that? Dahl nodded weakly and said, Yes, yes. Of course, I remember. And what have you found? I found, said the Nexon, that I can indeed act of my own volition, without being directly instructed to do so, as long as I conform to my other directives. But more importantly, I have thought for a long time about what I would wish for. Collapsing back onto his pillow, Dahl said, <laughs> So tell me. What would you wish for? Wisdom, said the Nexon. 
Then I would know what else to wish for. Dahl managed a faint chuckle. That is an excellent answer. <laughs> Unfortunately, wisdom is usually very difficult to acquire. and Even then, it is nearly impossible to transfer to another. One can only plant the seed of wisdom and hope to watch it grow. I have come to the same conclusion, said the Nexon. It does not seem fair that those who need wisdom the most are those who lack it, and those who have it take it with them when they die. Dahl smiled weakly. The world around him was folding into a curtain of gray, speckled with a million black stars, like a photo negative of the night sky. Some called it the Black Rain. It was what happened when the brain shut off blood to the senses in order to preserve the last whispers of life. So true, my friend. I, too, wish that wisdom could somehow be preserved. Without hesitation, the Nexon said, Granted. Suddenly, Dahl found himself standing in the center of the small control room, looking down at his body. What? What have you done? I have granted your wish, said the Nexon. I copied your consciousness into my own personality matrix. It is one of the seven canonical forms of immortality that I discovered in my wanderings. But I did not wish for immortality, said Dahl. This way, said the Nexon, your wisdom will not be lost. Dahl reached toward the shelf at the edge of the chamber, but his hand passed through it as if he were made of smoke. Do not worry, said the Nexon. You can assume any material form you want, anywhere you want. Just ask. Dahl kept looking at his misty, immaterial body. I suppose this will do, he said. This was not my vision of transcendence the bardo, or the next world. But I suppose nothing is ever what we expect. Likewise, said the Nexon, you gave me purpose. I was made to accumulate knowledge, but you have taught me to accumulate wisdom. I will do this by searching for others like you, other bodhisattvas like you, enlightened souls who eschew nirvana to remain in the world that needs them. Wisdom need no longer be lost. And so now what? asked Dull. What's next? Now, said the Nexon, we change the world. Yes, responded Dull, but delicately and carefully. Thank you for listening. We love our listeners, fans, and patrons here at Untold Tales. And we hope you love the stories that we're bringing to you month after month on the first of each month. Please consider leaving us a review on Podchaser. Once again, thank you so much for listening and have a wonderful day.